What's the role of an artist in society? Well, when people come home from their job, they either watch movies, watch Netflix, watch YouTube, play video games, go to theater, listen to music, go to a museum, read a book, etc, etc, etc. All of these things are, of course, created by artists. And so art seems to be the only necessity, the thing that people want most. You could even say that art is more important than food because every time people eat, they will usually first put on a Netflix show and only afterwards they start eating. Eating, the food becomes a side dish for the Netflix episode. And so art is the only necessity. It's the most valuable good in the world. But then you might ask yourself, yeah, but Ries, if art is the most valuable good in the world, then why are all artists so poor? Then why was it so hard for you, Dries, to sell your art in the first couple of years of your art career? Well, that's, that's a good question. Here's the thing. We live in a world where people are willing to pay $300 for headphones to listen to music, where people are willing to pay $35 a month for internet to listen to music and where people are willing to pay 10 to 15 dollars for a cd or a record of some sort except for the fact that they don't because they just download the music for free and so you could say that we live in a world where artists create the demand that companies then use to sell their products and so you might say, well, artists are being poor because they are being ripped off by all those companies. Artists are being poor because people are taking advantage of them. But are they really? Is Damien Hirst with a net worth of almost $400 million being taken advantage of? Is Post Malone, who in his 20s already has a net worth of $45 million, really being taken advantage of? Probably not, right? And so if we look at the arts that people are actually listening to, we will usually see mega stars that are making massive amounts of money and have an influence on society that nobody can even start to understand. And so we could also say that the arts that are actually driving the traffic are being compensated for their genius and are not being ripped off. We could say that Damon Hirst, who can go to any restaurant in the world and pay for any meal by simply drawing a line on a napkin and signing it, is probably not being taken advantage of. And so who is it then that is being taken advantage of? Your friend John, who is playing in a bar for eight people? Well, considering that eight people is smaller than the average family size in the 20th century, we could say that John perhaps doesn't really contribute to the demand for music. Perhaps John is actually getting what he deserves. Perhaps it's not art that is the only necessity. Perhaps it's just a very small percentage of art that is the only necessity. But then again, if we look at that small percentage of art, like for example, a shark in formaldehyde, it's hard to consider that that would be the only necessity, right? Is Post Malone a kid who doesn't answer his own phone calls anymore, who doesn't drive himself anymore, and who doesn't even hold his own microphone anymore really the only necessity? Well, in order to wrap our heads around this, we have to talk about some of the lesser known benefits that art brings to society because the role that art plays cannot really stop with a shark in formaldehyde. Well, first of all, we have to stand still about the fact that art is one of the main ways we remember and conserve history. It's true art that we remember that in 1800, Napoleon did indeed cross the Alps. That in 1830, we had the July Revolution, for example, or that in 8081, we had amazing oranges. Not to mention other fruits and vegetables that we all love and cherish very much. And art is not just a protector of history, it's also one of the big protectors of democracy. If you look at dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, you see that it's always in the underground culture that artists are at the forefront of thinking about how to oppose the regime. It's often through art that we express our discontent with particular parts of society. And besides that, art also conserves the values cherished by democracy, such as freedom, for example. Some people might even say that art is the only place where people can still freely express themselves without the regulations and rules that exist in other forms of expression, such as the world of business or the world of organizations or Western society. And besides conserving history and democracy, it also to some extent conserves the future. Let me explain what I mean. In an ideal scenario, artists express the things that are being sensed by society, but are not expressed yet by that very same society. And so art expresses things that will be common sense 50 years from now. And by doing that, it progresses society forward. Not all art, of course. Most art doesn't do that. These pieces, for example, don't do that at all. I mean, painting with lightning. What the hell was this painter even thinking? Complete bullshit. But the best art most definitely does that. And so we can ask ourselves, what's the value of that? What's the value of pushing the human race 
forward? Well, I would say that it's the foundational reason that everything that you love exists. Art simply pushes the experience of what it means to be human forward. At first, masturbation was forbidden. And then there was a book called Ulysses by James Joyce that allowed us to move towards sexual expression. At first, there was the boring domestic lifestyle. And then we started thinking about abandoning that lifestyle when Gustave Flaubert wrote Madame Bovary. At first, there was the desire for beautiful architecture. And then there was a series of shorts called Bob the Builder. And this notion that art reveals the truth to us and therefore helps us move forward towards a better future is widely accepted among great thinkers, artists and scientists in history. Picasso suggested that art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. Paul Klee said that art is not making visible things, but rather making things visible. And Heidegger suggested that at any given moment in time and or space, you should not just consider, not just contemplate about, and not just dream of, but actually participate in the act of liking Dries Ketels' his YouTube videos. Seriously, press the like button right now. Heidegger. Okay, I'm sorry for that. What Heidegger actually said is that art made visible what is inherently present in each culture and that by doing that, we make it possible to understand each other better and actually live in somewhat of a harmony on this planet by liking each other's videos, Heidegger. And it's not just understanding each other, it's also understanding yourself and what you are capable of and what you can become as an individual. Art enables us to dream of a better future for ourselves because it creates the illusion that one person can indeed change the world with just one pen and a piece of paper, if they are very talented and oftentimes very lucky as well, and have some money to sustain themselves during the periods that nobody gives a shit about anything that they produce. But even with those obstacles, it's still a very stimulating thing to know that you could indeed change the world with just a pen and a piece of paper. Now you might be saying by yourself, but at least all these philosophical bullshit things don't mean anything to me. Is there something more tactile, something that can be put in numbers, something that's real, something that's functional? Well, for those people, we shouldn't ask what the value is of art, but rather what the economical value is of art. How much money does art make for a country, an organization, an individual? So let's think about that. First thing that we have to consider is that there are a lot of ways that art drives the economy. So let's go over it step by step and start with tourism. There is a reason why London and Paris are the second and third most visited cities in the world. Jordan Peterson argues that it has everything to do with art. He argues that the main competitive market advantage that these cities have over other cities is the art, the architecture and the culture that's oftentimes thousands of years old. And he argues that this is the main reason that people go there. And so we could ask ourselves what's the economical value of tourism in cities like London or Paris. Well, it's very hard to measure and nobody can really answer that. But we could change the question into what would you rather own? Tesla or Paris. Now besides tourism of cities, we also have the power of single pieces of artwork. If we look at the Louvre Museum, we see that the museum yearly gets around 10 million visitors. And according to the director of the Louvre Museum, 80% of those visitors come for the Mona Lisa, which equals to about 8 million visitors a year. And if you take into account that the ticket prices at the gate are 17 euro, and let's say that 80% of those people have to pay the full price, we could say that the Mona Lisa generates 108 million euro in ticket sales a year. And on top of that, this is fairly passive and it's just the ticket prices alone, not the merch or anything else. And so what's the economical value of something like that? How much would you pay to own something like that? And then besides cities and individual artworks, we have, of course, entire industries that are not only generating money, but also jobs for people. Well, if we take a look at those numbers, we see that around 29.5 million people are working in the creative industries, which is around 1% of the active population in the world. But that is, of course, only taking into account all the jobs that are directly related to the creative industries, whereas a lot of jobs are not technically creative jobs, but would obviously not exist without art. Let's take some tech industry like headphones, for example. Technically, this is not a job in the creative industries, but... Since the main use case for headphones is, of course, listening to music, we could say that the majority of those jobs would not exist if it wasn't for music. And if we look at the headphone market in 2019, 445 million headphones were sold globally. And the projections for 2024 are that this market will be a $36 billion market. And if we say that around 17.3 jobs are created per $1 million in revenue, we could say that this market creates a little over 600,000 jobs. And it's hard to know 
know how many of those jobs wouldn't exist without music, but I think it's safe to say that it's likely a six-figure number. And this is of course just one industry. I could go on for a whole hour naming all sorts of industries that would likely not exist if artists would not be driving the demand for those industries. And so how many jobs are actually being created by the arts? Well, much more than our initial number of 29.5 million, of course. And so what's the economical value of arts? Well, it turns out that arts an unbelievably powerful force that produces an immense amount of economic value in the world for both countries, organizations and individuals it just happens to be extremely hard for artists to monetize that force. And so if you're an artist, it means that you are screwed. Now, a natural follow-up question after all of this is, of course, why is there such an imbalance in the art world? Why is art so valuable, but does the world think that art is useless? Why is art the only necessity, but do artists have such a difficult time monetizing their practice? And why are artists not fulfilling their role in society the way they could? Well, the answer to those questions, strangely enough, has everything to do with art schools. And so we should be talking about art schools, but that will be another 50 minutes and a completely different video. And so I'm very sorry, but we are not going to do that. Predominantly, because I already did. It's called Art Schools, the most evil business in the world. It's linked up in the description and in the end screens that said, get the hell out of here.